Hi, everyone. It's Plastic EP coming in from Melbourne. I usually say it's Mars. Well, let me tell you, you don't get VIP authors every day of the week because this man is so busy. His qualifications go for a mile. If I had to go through Jim Burke and Stats qualifications, I'll be here till Christmas. So we haven't <laughs> got time to do that. But I just want to wish you a warm uh, welcome, Jim. Thank you so much, Plastic EP. It is an honor to be back on your show, and it's always so much fun. And if people want to hear all that stuff, they can just look it up online. <laughs> now, listen, we know you got the new book, Mysteries in Music, Case Closed. And as I said, if I was part of your um, marketing team, this is the logo I'd go with, the tag for your book. Okay. The rock and roll detective, Jim Birkenstadt, he'll solve the case. Simple as that. Now, of course, that took me a while to get that together for you, but I thought I I'd it. mention that because you are the real rock and roll detective, and I did a bit of research, and I'm amazed that you did a lot of, of work on Beatles recordings, finding out facts about their recordings, and that's amazing that you started from there. You went into doing books. You've been working right. on films. You've been advising a lot of Beatle people, Apple and... Olivia Harrison, and, yeah, you've been helping people like Martin Scorsese. And, I mean, it's things like that, you know, that put you right up there. And as I said, people like you, the right quality books, they don't come every day because we know how thorough, how you look after the quality of your work of what you do, and it shows in the books and what you write about. And I also want to mention your other book, The Beetle That Vanished. You were the only one to cover Jimmy Nickel and tell his story which to me was unbelievable because at, at that point when that book came out, everybody wanted to know about it because no one knew the real story. And you were the man right. to deliver that to the world. And that's another worldwide, yeah, big seller. And I've actually got the book, as you know. Right. And I just want to say, we want Jimmy to come out of hiding if he can, because I know yourself, myself, we'd love to interview him. And I just want to say, Jimmy, if you're watching, Jim Birkenstead has done so much talking about you and your claim to fame. And I just want to tell you, the Beatle community are going to embrace you. Conventions are going to embrace you. And you've got a story to tell that needs to be told. And you're the only one that can tell it. So we appeal to you, myself and Jim. Come out of hiding wherever you are and tell your story because the world needs to know. Now, I need to ask you about the progress of the film, Jim. Okay. Well, so uh, The Beetle Who Vanished, uh, I don't know what the actual title will be, whether it'll be the same as the book or whether they'll use Jimmy Nichols' name, which I suspect they might. Uh, we have a screenwriter who's uh, coming on board. He will be work, I, I will be working with him as a screen consultant. So for example, if he is working on a certain area of Jimmy's story for the movie and uh, has a question or wants to be put in touch with someone who I interviewed, who knew Jimmy Nickel, that sort of thing, then I help out. Or if he has questions with, you know, how to create a plot twist, but have it still be very historically realistic, then he, would, he or she would come to me. And I think it's just been really delayed uh, because of the whole COVID situation. Um, the movie studio is called ECOS, and they are an independent company located in uh, the London area in England. And so uh, they haven't released, I don't believe they've released any films since about 2019. And uh, that's, it's sad because they do some really quality work uh, for people who are Beatle fans. Uh, and I know every Beatle fan watches your program. They did a really good show, a really good movie called Nowhere Boy, which was about John Lennon growing up. And then eventually, uh, yeah, eventually, I think the movie ends about the time that the Beatles start to become quite famous, but they do very quality, good work, but they take their time and, um, you know, I am hoping that I'll have more information for you. You know, when when I do, I'll be happy to share it with you and your uh, viewers. But right now, it's just in the stage of, of the screenplay being written. I've got to say, Jim, I've seen that movie. That is a great movie and so authentic with the scenes, everything, even John Lennon's bed, right, his bedroom. 
I mean, it's yeah. so authentic what they do. It's like amazing. Now, I just right. want to say, you're the uh, artist who did your uh, book cover there for Mysteries in the Music, Case Closed. I want to mention her, right? Zena. She's yep. from London. She did an amazing job on the cover. Tell me a little bit more about Zena. Z, I call her Zena, and Zena is a wonderful artist, uh, originally from Lebanon, I believe, and she's living in London, and I just became just blown away by her artwork uh, of classic rock artists, and it's really interesting because she's in her 30s, and here she is completely enamored with classic rock people, and so... I started to see her paint online on Instagram and I recommend people go search Zina, Z-I-N-A at Instagram. And it's so cool to see how she sets the stage. Like maybe it's a uh, Jim Morrison she's painting and she'll have candles out and then she'll be playing certain evocative doors songs and get in the mood. And then you actually get to see her painting. So I was blown away by those pictures and I thought, oh, well, I'm doing this great book about all these different rock and roll mysteries. I'd love to have her artwork on the cover. And I was so fortunate and now we're, we're friends and we, um, we, of course, are collaborating because she did the cover plus some of her pictures or portraits are inside the book as well. And she recently came and uh, joined me at the New Jersey Beatles Fest and uh, was a big hit with the fans. And she had her artwork there and the, the book and we had a great time. I'm hoping she'll come to the Chicago event as well, but she is like the next big thing when it comes to rock and roll artwork. I'm, I just believe she's gonna, the sky's the limit for Xena. That's amazing. Now I just wanna say, Mysteries in the Music, it's available all over the world, Amazon.com. But, you know, the great thing is it's already for sale in Australia, right? All yeah. over the place. It's at uh, Angus and Robertson. They're big sellers. It's also mm -hmm. at booktopia.com.au. Now, that book is one of the biggest worldwide sellers now at the moment. And it's what it's been on Amazon on their list as number one sellers now for a couple of months, hasn't it, Jim? It has been on some of the lists, yeah. Uh Certainly, it, you know, that fluctuates day by day. But, yeah, sometimes it's at one, sometimes it's at six, whatever. But it, it's I'm just very gratified that people want to know what really happened in these mysteries. And it, it's great because also each chapter really appeals maybe to a different fan base. There's a Nirvana chapter. There's a Traveling Wilburys mystery chapter. There's a Beach Boys chapter. Uh, a Bob Marley chapter and on and on Elvis Presley. And I also tried to cover different decades. So of rock and roll. So it really covers uh, a broad range of classic rock artists over, um, you know, 40, 50 years, even uh, a blues singer who used uh, different names uh, to promote his music back in the late 1920s. So lots of interesting uh, stories that I think everyone will enjoy. And so far, everyone has told me they like it. So I'm, I'm real glad to be entertaining people with these stories. Now, I believe there's about eight stories in the book. That's correct? Mm -hmm. That is. Yep. I don't want to get into too much because I want people to buy the book and actually read it. Because we right. can only skim over some of the stories. Yeah. But I also want to say the story that I like, right? Is the one about yeah. Louie Louie and them having yeah. a problem that there's in fact there's words in there that are rude words and they did an investigation into this <laughs> song, Louie Louie. And I also got to say that song, Louie Louie, has been covered by so many artists that you can't actually understand the words. <laughs> right. It's uh, well, you know, depending on who's singing it, you can understand the words, but in the case of the Kingsman. The uh, at the time of the actual recording, I, I interviewed the lead singer, Jack Eli, uh, fortunately, right before he passed away, maybe six months before he passed away. And it was very interesting. It was I also inter interviewed one of the producers, too, on the record. 
And they both said, you know, this wasn't like a studio like we know studios today. It was a kind of a warehouse garage place. And there was this big, long wire up in the in the middle of the room, hanging down with a microphone on it. And the entire band was supposed to be playing and singing to this one microphone. So, you know, the fact that it does sound so good is amazing. But the singer, Jack Eli, told me that he had to raise his head like I'm showing you now. And you can tell it changes your voice and your air. You don't have as much airflow. And he said those are the things that affected why he wasn't singing in a way that we could understand the words and they sound a bit garbled. And uh, one of the interesting things that I discovered in, in that chapter, as I looked through the hundreds of pages of FBI uh, previously classified records, when they went after the band for obscenities is that they never asked who sang lead on this song when it was recorded. I mean, that's a huge FBI blunder right there. And, and the book is really fun because that chapter is really fun because it almost is like a dark comedy to see how poorly the FBI ran this investigation. And, uh, you know, we all, everybody thinks their government will take care of them. Well, maybe not so much with the FBI because, uh, you know, if this is an example of their work, it's, it's, it's just pretty poor. But, That's but, yeah, a fantastic it's topic, Rod humorous. D. I What's just that? want to say the other topic that really interests me, right, is who really discovered Elvis. And, I mean, you covered oh, yeah. that. And, I mean, to me, that's really something there where he went into the Sun Studios and he made a recording for his mother. Just tell me yeah. a bit about that, but let's not get too much into the story because I want him to read it in the book. Sure. So he, you know, Elvis uh, had been listening to a lot of different types of music on the radio. He liked gospel. He liked rhythm and blues. Uh, rock and roll wasn't really uh, a thing yet, to be honest. Uh, and he, he wondered how his voice might sound and he thought it would make a nice gift for his mom. And so he went in to sun and uh, it was on a Saturday. And what's interesting is Sam Phillips wasn't around at the time. He was, he was actually in the back room. He was there having a meeting. So uh, Marion Keisker, his assistant came out and uh, recorded him for the first time. And she and Sam Phillips have disagreed on that because Sam has tried to spin it a different way over the years. But I dug in and really talked, well, I talked to um, Scotty Moore, who was there uh, and gave Elvis a, kind of an A&R first visit at his home with Bill Black and listened to Elvis sing a number of different songs and styles. And then he also was there witnessing Marion actually talking to Sam Phillips about Elvis. And so it's just really an interesting chapter on what really happened, not the, not the sort of legend that Sam Phillips created for himself uh, as he got older. And I think people will be very surprised by the um, actual quotes of, of uh, Scotty Moore and of uh, Marion who were present at the time and also um, other people who were around who, who knew what was really going on. And so I, I set that record straight. So people know who really, um, who really discovered Elvis Presley. Yeah, I really got to say there, another chapter there on the traveling Wilburys, you know, the amazing thing about the traveling Wilburys, this is true. Everyone bought the first CD volume one, yeah. Then they bought volume three, and then everyone's saying, where's volume two? I mean, that's right, right. <laughs> well, you know, that's a perfect example of George Harrison's sense of humor right there. He's the one that said, we're going to call it volume three. And it's really number two. So I think he was very, you know, even too, when he started to do interviews after volume one came out, he would make up like all these silly stories and the, you know, whether it was the New York Times or the BBC in London, whoever he spoke to, 
they would just gobble up these silly, humorous aspects, you know, like, well, I think Prince Charles might have told us to name our group the Traveling Wilburys. You know, he would just say these random, hilarious things with a straight face. And, and then later they were like, really? And he'd say, well, would I lie to you? <laughs> just very funny, you know, and of course, also he appeared, they appeared, uh, some of the members of the Wilburys appeared together on some of these uh, interviews and, and they're really quite fun. I'm, I'm sure people can find these uh, after they read the book, they'll be able to find them on YouTube because uh, they're really enjoyable. I know that they did a great one, uh, sadly, right after Roy Orbison died, uh, three of the members, Jeff Lynn, George Harrison, and Tom Petty did a great MTV interview uh, before they before they went on to uh, do the end of the line video, which also pays tribute to to Roy Orbison. So there's just a lot of fun to that chapter. I, I've recently heard from people who um, are re really considered themselves experts on the traveling Wilburys, and they said, "I can't believe how much new information you dug up." on the whole beginnings and mythology of the Traveling Wilburys and how the guitars were designed by George Harrison. And it's just really a fun chapter. Uh, I was fortunate to be able to work with George Harrison while he was still living and then Olivia and Danny Harrison. And I got to work on the uh, Traveling Wil uh, Wilburys box set as well. So it was a pleasure to be able to um, you know, give, give people a lot of fun uh, bits of information that weren't really well known about how those Wilburys had such a good time just making music and how they avoided uh, the usual pitfalls of supergroups, uh, which many of which have broken up over the years, you know, and the Wilburys never broke up. They may be the only supergroup that never broke up. I just want to know if you know it's true that after Roy Orbison passed, that they wanted Del Shannon to join the group, and he agreed, but it just didn't happen because he passed away as well. Well, um, Del Shannon worked with Jeff Lynn, and I think that that was subsequent to the, after the first album and after Roy Orbison died, and I think the media came up with that story based upon the fact that Del Shannon was working with Jeff Lynn and maybe some of the other Wilburys sat in on a session song or something. And so that created a rumor, but I was not able to find anything to support that story uh, from the Orbison family, the Harrisons or anywhere else. I really don't think Roy Orbison could be replaced. And I don't think, I think that they created this really special group of friends who made that music together. And I, I don't think they ever considered replacing a friend. In fact, um, George joked later, uh, I think it was between albums, he was doing an interview and someone said, well, can anybody be in the Wilburys? And he said, well, you know, I think, uh, I think he said something like, I think Little Richard could be in the Wilburys, but not Hall and & Oates <laughs> and that sort of thing. So he was sort of using that question to tell people really, I like this artist, but this one I'm not too too hot on, which again was very humorous. Now, I just want to say for the new generation of Beatle fans that are coming up, the BBC sessions, and I just want to point out a few songs which you'll be familiar with, uh, Jim. These are mm -hmm. my favourites that I believe most Beatle fans have to discover sooner or later, right? Mm -hmm. Clara Bella, Leave My Kitten Alone, which is fantastic, that recording. Soldier of Love, and the one after 909 that they tried to record, I think in 63 mm -hmm. or 64, and it just didn't work, and they left yeah. it till the end of their career. <laughs> it's interesting that you bring that up because when you first said, you know, the BBC sessions, the first song that popped into my head, because it's my favorite one, is Clara Bella. And until that came out, I... I had never heard that song before, but the Beatles version is fantastic. People should should seek out the Beatle BBC sessions. They're great. 
uh, what's great, I think, is there. It's like the Beatles are playing live there on these radio shows, so you get to hear them live very clearly without all the screaming and the Beatlemania and all of that. That's one of the best things about it. I think "Leave My Kitten Alone" is a fantastic song, a fantastic yeah. single. I don't know why they didn't whack that on "Please Please Me." Yeah, I agree. It it really rocks too. And the quality of that recording is unbelievable. Yeah, it's great. Uh, well, I'm glad they put it out on, uh, didn't they put it out on the anthology at some point? I think so. Yeah. They also yeah. released Bad Boy. That's another great one too. Now, I just <laughs> want to say, Jim, the book that you've spent your time, and I know this took a long time to do this book, because I believe I interviewed you about a year ago, just over a year, and you were still working on it. So I know right. that that book is taking a lot of your time, how long in total did it take you to write the book? I think Mysteries in the Music Case Closed took about five years. Uh, the, and that's mostly research and interviewing people. I interviewed probably, I don't know, 50 people that, that were in the know, um, including people like Jan Wenner of Rolling Stone, Glenn Johns, uh, Greg Jacobson, who was friends of Dennis Wilson, when Dennis and Charles Manson were hanging out together. And, you know, so uh, and, and then on the who shot, uh, did the CIA kill Bob Marley? I actually found one of the actual CIA agents in Jamaica at the time of the shooting who was in charge of the CIA down there. And he was posing as a, uh, like a, an assistant to the ambassador. So I really go the extra mile to get the people, you know, who know what they're doing, but it takes time, you know, and you have to build trust with them that you're not just, you know, doing some say headline newspaper article that you're really working on a serious historical book and you're trying to get to the bottom of things. So it took about five years of research, and then I'd say about one year to write it. Yeah. Now, Jim, I want you to tell everybody the links that you know, because you might have a favorite link where they can buy this book and the Beeler that vanished as well. Sure. So um, I have an author page or an author uh, website for each book individually, uh, where you can find out everything you need to know about the book. You can download an excerpt, etc. Uh, and at each of these websites that I'll give you, you can also order, no matter where you are in the world, you can order an autograph copy from me if you'd like. But of course, Amazon is all around the world, so you can, you can get it on Amazon easily. You can order it from bookstores anywhere in the world, these books. But if, you, if you're interested in learning more about each book before you decide or you want a signed copy, Mysteries in the Music Case Closed. The website is uh, an easy one to remember. It's www.musicmysterybook.com. Musicmysterybook.com. And then uh, The Beetle Who Vanished is www.thebeetlewhovanished.com. I just want to thank you for being on the show. And I'm just saying, how fantastic would it be if Jimmy Nickel comes to the premiere of the movie of the Beatles that vanished or whatever they call it. I would love to walk down the, the red carpet with Jimmy Nickel at that movie. And I'm sure that it would be interesting to him if he's, I'm going to assume that at some point someone gave him a copy of the book, but I think that what he'll like about it is the book isn't just about two weeks when he was with the Beatles the whole first third of the book is how he built his own career as a very young man, young drummer, uh, and how he got into the position to be asked by the greatest group in the world at the time to be in the band to, to help take, take over for Ringo being ill. Then the middle third of the book takes us in great detail through that world tour and quite a bit about uh, for people who live in Australia You'll really learn a lot, I think, about the tour with Jimmy Nickel when he came down there in 64. And then the last third of the book is, what does a 25-year-old young man who's been to the top of the entertainment world do after 
he's been with the Beatles. And, and that's the whole last third of the book. But I think he'd appreciate that it was his whole career, not just someone focusing on, on those two weeks, because he did a lot of great things. Well, i got to say, be, living here in Melbourne, Australia, that's the place where the five Beatles were here. Uh, Ringo came in and played yep. the Festival Hall concert. They said goodbye huh. to Jimmy, and he flew out from Essendon Airport. So as a first-generation baby boomer, I know all about it because I was here and I actually read the newspaper, right, when he was on the front page leaving to go back yep. to the uh, UK. They gave him a gold watch and they said goodbye. And I believe... Mm-hmm. Ringo had tonsillitis, and that was the reason why he got, couldn't go on the tour. That's correct, isn't I, it, from memory? That is correct, yes. And, in fact, uh, here's an exclusive for your uh, listeners and viewers. Um, I now have the gold watch that Jimmy Nickel was given by Brian Epstein. <laughs> I should have I brought it with me. <laughs> that's, that's unbelievable right there. And yeah. what you could do is I'd start wearing it, Jim. Seriously, like, I, I take. I can wear it as a pendant. Yeah, that's a good idea. Yeah, I should have it right now. I have it framed uh, with a set of uh, John, Paul, George, and Jimmy autographs. What's the engraving say on the back of the watch? Oh, now you got me. I think uh, it says thanks from Brian and the boys. Yeah, Brian and the boys, and it's got the date, and it says to Jimmy Nickel, and. I mean, they took up the whole little back of that watch, gold back of the watch. The whole thing is covered with words like like those that we've just said, yeah. Well, Jim Birkenstad, I want to say you've written two great worldwide selling books. They're all over the world. People are buying them. And as I said, don't wait. Go out there. Buy both books. Because if you want to get something that you really want to be enthralled with the reading about these two stories, yeah. like another two books, one on the Beatle that vanished and mysteries in the music case closed. You've got eight stories there. It's unbelievable what you've done, Jim. And Plastic EP takes his head on off to you because somebody wants to buy quality books, they don't have to go any further than yourself. It's just fantastic what you've done and your dedication for Beatle fans in the craft that you do. We salute you, Jim. Thank you so much, Plastic Guy. I can't tell you how much I appreciate your kind words. Because, you know, those are a lot of years that you just spend, you know, at a desk doing research. And, and it's nice when you, it finally comes out and everyone can enjoy it. And so it's a real honor to be on your show. And, and thanks very much for the kind words and for having me on. Thanks, everyone. Stay tuned. Keep watching Plastic EP Live TV because you don't know who's on. But as I said, Jim Birkenstad is a VIP. And we love you, Jim. That's all I'm going to say. Thanks so much.